This is What's Wild in New Hampshire by wildlife biologist Eric Orr. <laughs> Here we are moving into 2022 and I am back at my one of my favorite books, the Bible. The History of New Hampshire Game and Fur Bears by Helenette Silvers. She was a, <clears throat> a biologist back in the maybe the 40s, certainly the 50s and the 60s before my time when I started with the New Hampshire Fishing Game Department in 1976. So she was just ahead of me, as were <laughs> many of the folks that I worked with. Most were World War II veterans, as I recall. So the history of New Hampshire Game and Fur Bearers. Today I'm going to talk about wolves. The history of wolves in New Hampshire. And uh, <clears throat> let's see what she has to say. It's several pages long. So page 287 of the history of New Hampshire Game and Fur Bearers. It says here, quite prolific and possessing few animal enemies, the wolf Canis lupus lycon was extremely common in all parts of New England at the time of discovery. It was one of the diver diverse of diverse colors, some sandy colored, some grizzled, some black, Morton, 1637. Except in the, in the very early days when black wolves were especially valued by the savages, the pelts have have been of little commercial value. Morton, 1637, wrote that the Indian would gladly exchange 40 beaver skins for the pelt of one black wolf. And Wood, 1634, stated that black wolf was valued by the Indians at five or six pounds sterling. Even in southern New England, where where there were there were less disadvantage from the deep snow, the numbers of deer may have been limited by the less by food scare, less by food scarcity than by the predation of wolves. These prey upon the deer very much. Morton, 1637, uh, quote: "It's not for the common, if if it were not for the common devourer, the wolf would moose all moose all better able to defend themselves were likewise much devoured. Hare, rabbit, and other small." Smaller species were also eaten. The wolf, well, wolves ranged widely and shifted their range according to the availability of prey species. Perusal of almost any single local history might convey the impression that they were con constantly present since since the periods when the wolves were about were absent or not usually emphasized. Collectively, New Hampshire histories show they occurred periodically, both a result of their wandering and the marked fluctuations in numbers to which they were apparently subject. Records are too sketchy to prove that they were definitely cyclical, but there is a su strong suggestion that they were. Quote, wolves came in swarms. They were not plenty at all times. They seemed to roam over a vast extent of the country, remaining in any one place only a short time. The, the moose and deer killed and all the small animals devoured the hungry demons were off to pastures new into other forests teeming with life. Wolves in great numbers came howling from the north in 1744, 1764, and 1784. Occasionally a few would be found in the intermediate years, little 1888. With the coming of civilizations, civilization, quantities of game which had been available to the wolves were consumed by the settlers. This loss was partially compensated by domestic livestock, to which the wolves were a constant threat. The colonists feared for their own lives as well, although there was almost no evidence that humans were ever molested. In the White Mountains region, one Indian was said to have been killed and devoured by a starving pack after killing seven of their numbers before he was overpowered, Witten, 1834. The fact that the carcass of seven wolves were re reputedly found intact beside the bones of an Indian cast doubt on the authenticity of this tale. Wolves have no objective ob objection to eating each other and it is scarcely credible that the remaining wolves would have retired from the field after picking the Indian's bones, leaving the dead wolves untouched. Either the story has lost nothing in telling or has no basis in fact. The latter conclusion is probably nearer the truth. Whereas similar dramatic incidents 
are recounted in the history of every township within miles of their occurrence and considerable po poetic license in shifting back and forth across town and county boundaries was assumed. This writer, Helen at Silvers, has located only the single the only the single reference to the above incident. Domestic animals were precious and their loss was a serious setback. The threat of danger to stock and personal fear for for the incentives for relentless war on the wolves of the wilderness. They were hunted and trapped in all manner and ways. Great hunts were sometimes organized by a hundred or more men who surrounded an area, driving the wolves before them towards the center. Occasionally, as many as 500 or 600 men assembled for these drives, which were often effective in cleaning up a whole township, Hoover unpublished. Nevertheless, as late as the Revolution, Belknap, 1812, considers wolves very common and very noxious. So common uh, through the Revolution, 1776. For the from the first most towns paid local bounties, records of depredation of wolves and bounties paid come from all ten counties, and those mentioned below cover about a fraction of a, the voluminous references to wolves in New Hampshire. Rockingham County. Wolf packs which hung around the outskirts were one of the greatest sources of annoyance to the settlers of Salem. They were most troublesome in the winter when it was hard for them to get food. In 1662, the town voted a bounty of 10 shillings to any Indian who should kill a wolf, Gilbert, 1907. 1751, Salem was paying a bounty of 10 pounds, old tenor, pounds old tenor for every wolf's head and 3 pounds for each whelp. It was considered unsafe to travel unarmed after dark, heard 1882, although the danger was perhaps exaggerated. Under a town regulation set up in 1716, Newfields paid bounties on 138 wolves from 1735 to 1737. Fitz, 1912. Stratford County. Wild animals ventured into the most thickly settled parts of the village of Rochester, pilfering crops and sheep. A bounty of 10 shillings for both grown bear and wolves was offered in 1751. A year or so afterwards, this was collected on five wolves. They were continued to be common after, after the, this time, McDuffie, 1892. Belknap County. At the time Barnstead was settled, bears and wolves were troublesome to flocks and plantations of John Pittman. It was voted to give three pounds bounty on a, on a head of gray wolf and 10 pound shillings on a on a haid for the whelp caught within the bounds of the town, Jewett, 1872. Sand Sanderton paid $10 for adults and $5 for whelps. Encouraged by the bounties, the inhabitants succeeded in, expir in expirtating, extirpating them before many years. The laugh was shot in 18, uh, 1790 after having just killed 10 sheep, Runnell, 1882. Gilmington voted a bounty on wolves in 1788, Lancaster, 1845. Hillsborough County, John Cummings and Joseph Synods, coming to settle the town of Hancock, were compelled to swing firebrands during most of their first night there to keep wolves away from the fresh meat they had in camp, Hayward, 1889. Smith, 1876, wrote that in early days at Peterborough, the manufacture of flax preceded that of woolen of woolens because it was impractical to keep sheep. Captain Thomas Morrison lost 50 to wolves in a single night. Wolves were thick around Antrim for about a half century after settlement. Most of the damage was to sheep, although rarely and unusually without success they attacked cattle. This town, as well as the whole state, was greatly troubled with wolves in the winter of 1783-84. They came in about the settlement in vast numbers from the forest to the west and north, starving and ravenous, destroying sheep and even cattle. A bounty was paid by the state, but the urgency of the case was settled in the town, and the town took it up, and Antrim voted five dollars of Ditton to the court act for killing a wolves to be paid by this town. It was more than a year before the excitement died away, after which gradually these pests disappeared. The loss from wolves was substantial during the falling winter of 1784 and 85, which was 
unusually long and cold with ex excessively deep snow. Crocker in 1880. Witten, 1852, confirms conditions in Antrim, Antrim in the winter of 1780-45. Deep snow lasted into April, and wolves were particularly destructive of sheep, and even cattle were endangered. Merrimack County, in 1784, Loudon paid a bounty of 10 pounds for every wolf killed in town. Heard, 1885. At Andover, in 1790, three gray wolves came into the, barnstead, uh, the barnyard of Joseph Fellows and killed three sheep. Hunters tracked a pack of wolves from the Webster Lake towards Curasage Mountain and thence to the town of Hill uh, in 1805, Eastman, 1910. Wolves were abundant in Bosco and around the time of settlement. They were not completely eradicated for nearly a century, the last being killed near Cook Hill in Webster, then a part of Bosco in 1831 or 32, Coffin, 1878. Wolf Meadow in Hopkinton was named because of the frequency of the appearance of wolves in that area, Lord, 1890. Cheshire County, the, long after the wolves and bears had been driven from the territory north and south and east and west, they found a comparatively safe retreat on the almost in inaccessible sides and in the steep ravines of Monadnock, and they, were, and they maintained themselves with, with great boldness and vigor. As wolves rarely attack men, except when near, nearly starved, they were chiefly dreaded because of the depredation made by them upon calves and sheep. Norton, 1888. The last, last wolf was seen in Gilsom in the winter of 1847-48. Hayward, 1881. Sullivan County. There are, there are few references to wolves in the histories of this county. One was killed in Washington in the winter of 1847-48, but this wolf the same mentioned in the preceding paragraph, was chased across the line from Chester County, surrounded as it was by the areas where, where wolves were plentiful, and there's no reason to doubt that wolves were present in the Sullivan County. It's much more likely that historians simply failed to mention them. Carroll County, Conway, 1777, voted to pay a bounty of one pound, 10 shillings for adult wolves and four shillings for whelps. In 1816, the town was paying $20 a head. Tamworth was also afflicted with wolves at this period and paid a like sum. Merrill, 1889. Grafton County at Haverhill, the local bounty of six shillings a head was paid in 1772. Child, 1886. It was necessary to pen sheep at night and wolves frequently approached within 10 rods of the house. Power, 1814. While most of the able-bodied men of Plymouth were away fighting the revolution, the women and children were often frightened at night by the howling of wolves. In the neighboring town of Warren, wolves prowled about the houses sometimes at night, standing with their paws on their windows, window sills peer, to peer inside. It is noted that Dick French of ben, Benton was a famous wolf hunter. Further north in Lyman, Nathal, Nathal, Nathaniel Partridge was, was treed by a pack of wolves, and, and forced to spend the night in a tree. Child, 1888. Raoul Colby settled in Enfield in 1779, encountered wolves on his journey to the township. Coas County, wolves continued here after they had disappeared in other parts of the state. At Randolph, they were reported to have scratched the doors of the Pioneer's Cabin, Cross, 1924, and Peter Gansby, an early settler of Stratford, lost 20 sheep in one night. Thompson, 1925. On the side of the mountains, Ethan Allen Crawford found wolves most annoying in the early 1800s in spite of his being a comp competent hunter. <clears throat> One December night, four descended on his flock of sheep, which took refuge among the cattle. A dog which Crawford sent to drive away the marauders was nearly torn to pieces. Crawford finally sold the sheep rather than lose them to wolves. He once demonstrated domesticated two young wolves which he had picked up as pups. They became quite tame and never harmed any of his family or visitors, although they, were, they persisted in chasing pigs, sheep, and calves and pulling the tail feathers out of his fowl. Crawford, 1883. It has been realized, however, that deer became plentiful between 1830 and 1840. Wolves returned to Coos and raised havoc with both deer and domestic stock. The last wolf in Lancaster was trapped in 1840. Before this date, they were frequently heard in the woods a half mile east of the village. 
They remained common in the northern township and some, until some years later, but were rare before 1880, Merrill 1888. State bounties state were in force almost continuously from the establishment of the province till, the, till near the opening of the present century, 1900, long after wolves had ceased to be an important economic vi liability. Uh, for a complete list, uh, records of bounty payments are not available for the years 1850 and only after 1882, where the expenditures broke down, broken down according to species payment on the wolves from the later date to 1885 when the law was repealed, after, are shown in Table 21. Wolf bounties were also extremely high, often as much as $20, even in colonial times. We know, indeed, that it must have been a pressing necessity that that promoted the offering of liberal bounties for the extermination of these beasts. So here is the list of bounties, 1882, 2, uh, 83, 84, known, 80, 1885, 1, 1886, 7, none, 88, 3, 18, uh, 89, 90, 91, 92, 0, 1893, 12, so the 12 were take were uh, bounties were paid on 12 in 1893, 1894, 0, and 1895 is the last one listed at two. Last couple of three paragraphs here for the effort to expend expend in, in killing wolves. Sometimes the proceeds of a hunt meant no more than a barrel of rum to refresh the the hundred or more men who had participated. The concentrated program of eradication must have played a major part in elim eliminating wolves, which, except for human interf interferences, would have ensured their future by increased inroads into domestic flocks and herds. Nevertheless, without the added incentives of bounties, they would have been dispatched as fast as humanly possible. Another factor which <clears throat> must have played important to their extirpation, if only through the bringing them into the vicinity of humans, where they were only where they were easily killed was a reduction of game population on which they preyed. Deer and many other species reached the lowest level around 1880. It is interesting to note that that this is the date given by most authorities for the disappearance of wolves in New Hampshire, although few individuals persisted after this date. So 1880 was when they were essentially extirpated. As late as 1930, one wolf skin was listed on the Trapper's Report, the Hampshire Fishing Game, 1932. Wow. There, there's no information as to its origin, and, and it may not have been correctly identified. The last definite record, then, is two reported taken in 1895, the year the bounty was repe repealed. There was but one paragraph in her History of New Hampshire Game and Fur Bears about coyotes, and here it is. The coyote was not originally present in the state, and a single specimen is known to have been taken here. This was shot in Holderness on October 24, 1944, by a fox hunter, and was identified by Herbert R. Siegler, Chief of the Management and Research Division of the Fishing Game Department, and Stanley P. Young of the Fish and Wildlife Service. A year later, one was reported to have been observed near Berlin on York, York Pond Road. So. There were no coyotes. This book was was uh, printed in the mid '50s, and there were but one report or two reports of coyotes by the mid 1950s here in New Hampshire. That is the end of the history of wolves in New Hampshire.